Um, yeah, Pastor, if you can kindly pray. Okay. Lord, well, let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Father, this uh, morning we come before you, Lord. Very grateful hearts of Father for giving us this wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Lord, for good night rest and this new day, oh God, every day that you give us, Lord, matters for us and it's counted, oh Father. And we just want to do the best that we can, oh God, for your glory, for your kingdom. And here, Lord, we meet together as meet to meet. Bible study group, and you have been ministering to us, God. You have been talking to us, O oh Father, revealing your truth to us, O oh God, and helping us, O oh God, to look into your words more deeply, Father, dig out the meat and thank you, Lord. You know, who is working so hard, laboriously, O oh God, uh, to get this word, this meat out of your word, O oh God. We want to thank you for me, and Sangeeta, and Ruben, and Itai, and thank you, Lord, for blessing them in every way. And I pray that you continue to bless them, God, and do them, oh God, bless us in the church. But today, God, in this meeting with Bible study, Father, you speak to us and help us, God, to keep ourselves open, to listen to you, God, accept the truths that we learn, and God, apply them to our lives so that people will know that we are your disciples, oh God, we are Christians, and that, oh Lord, many will get the gospel. So we commit ourselves this meeting with Bible study. In your hand this morning, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to Milk to Meet. It is uh, March 6, 2022. And um, um, it's actually my beloved's birthday. So, Sangeeta's happy birthday. <laughs> in today's session, we'll look at the book of De Deuteronomy. Uh, we'll continue studying from chapter uh, 28. We'll be looking at the last section of Deuteronomy chapter 28, which is sectioned on the um, on the curses or for disobedience. So it's part four, but it's also the final part that I plan to do for this chapter. Um, as we've been going through this chapter, you know that it's been one of the hardest chapters to process, and we'll expand on that as well as we continue the study. The psalmist says in um, Psalm chapter 57, verse 1, Be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me, for my soul trusts in you. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. So um, I'll start off actually with, uh, with a question. Uh, it, over here, God is likened to that of being a bird. Uh, what is this bird that God is actually likened to? Any thoughts? In the shadow of thy wings will I take, will I make my refuge? Is what the psalmist is saying. What bird comes to mind? A mother bird. A mother bird. Okay. Anything more specific? Because the chicks uh, hide in the shadow of the wings. Okay. Beautiful. So. So, so the Bible actually says, so the, we'll actually look at that in the context. We'll hold on to that thought as a mother bird that holds on uh, where the chicks hide under the shadow of its wings. Um, in fact, in Exodus chapter 19, verse 4, you've seen where the Israelites were on top of the wings, where Exodus 19, four, verse 4, it says, you've seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bore you or I bear you, remember that word bear, you on eagle's wings and brought you into myself. So it's amazing where God is saying, I carried you out of Egypt uh, and redeemed you. And then what Sangeeta was saying in terms of the mother bird, we'll actually explore that as well. The question I want to ask us is, um, are you under the shadow of God's wings today? And keep a hold on to that thought as we continue the study as well. We've been looking at the threefold cord in scripture, the kingdom cord, the covenant cord, and the salvation cord from the very first pages of Genesis all the way to the, to the last letter in the book of Revelation, God's kingdom, and you know what he's a king of, he's a king of kings and the Lord of lords, and to him is ascribed all dominion and majesty and power and blessing and honor that we ought to, and how there's a satanic kingdom that's in opposition to it. And in, in the fall of man, man lost that relationship that he had with God when he sinned willfully against God, disobeying God. And so God actually establishes a contractual relationship with a covenant program that we see throughout the pages of scripture. And that covenant program consummates and is even made possible because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross by being our savior. And so the salvation cord that kind of threads through the three, the two other cords that we see in scripture itself. So 
It's the kingdom and covenant program of God is what we've been studying and we've been at the covenant program, looking at the Mosaic covenant. A couple more sessions and we'll be moving from the covenant program, from the Mosaic covenant to the, uh, the Davidic covenant, which is next. Um, a quick recap on the consequences of curses for disobedience. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, it talks about what we looked last week from 47 to 57. Not serving God means you're serving someone else. The people of Israel did not serve the Lord, and so their disobedience led them to become servants of a foreign nation. Uh, servitude under a foreign nation was a consequence of their disobedience. Scarcity of the fruit of the cattle and the fruit of the land was also a consequence of their disobedience. And then we looked at how you know, servitude, scarcity, and being under siege, that brings great scarcity and horrifying desperation to the point of cannibalism is a consequence of disobedience as well. We looked last week also in terms of what it said as part of their scarcity, they will have no corn, no wine, no oil, no kind, no flocks of sheep, which would mean that there'll be no ways for them to be able to offer a sacrifice that is acceptable to God himself, that'll be accepted by God. And we saw how it was it was a typology or a typology of, of Christ himself, who is the fallen corn of wheat, who verily, verily said, unless a corn of wheat falls and dies, it remains alone. And John chapter 12, verse 23, 24 establishes it. But when it dies, it actually brings forth many fruit. And the fruit of Christ's sacrifice is the church and, who, and, and his people being able to be in a relationship back with God. And we see also how Christ likens himself to be the fruit of the wine in Luke chapter 22, verse 17 and 20, when he gives the great the, the communion ordinance. And, uh, and the oil is symbolic, actually, of the anointing presence of the Holy Spirit given to them that believe in Jesus. And Jesus is the only acceptable and the perfect sacrifice to God. And to be in Christ means you're no longer under the curse. To be under the curse means you're separated from Christ Jesus by willful disobedience of unbelief in him. So we looked and we studied that last week. Uh, the, the overall section in uh, Deuteronomy in terms of 28, the section on the curses, we've looked at the first four sections from the antithesis to be blessings to the Lord shall in terms of the, the section that starts with the Lord shall and then the next section is thou shall. We looked last week on servitude, scarcity and siege and today we'll actually be looking at the final section which is plagues, plugged, panic and peonage or, sla or slavery from Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 58 to 68. So turn with me with your, in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 58 to 68. We're going to be reading from it and then expositing on it and seeing what God is to teach us, each one of us, the truth that is in his word. Also, as I say always, this text is one of the hardest material that you know, it's to read and process, but we must be very careful to recognize that all scripture is God breathed and it's given unto us for doctrine, for correct, for reproof, for correction and instruction in righteousness, so that we, the man and woman of God, can be thoroughly furnished unto good works, which we see in the second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, where unto good works, and that good works, as Matthew 5, 16 says, that bring glory to God the Father in heaven. So it's not that works make us righteous, but because we are righteous, we ought to do good works that will bring and glorify God the Father. Again, a warning I will give you is as you read through this text, it may seem and come across like God is actually very harsh, but it can, without the proper context, it can lead to misconceptions and misunderstandings of the nature and the very character of a loving God and who's gracious. So pay attention to the seriousness of the text, but don't be very quick to conclusion without deeper study. So Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 58, it says, if thou wilt, if thou wilt not observe to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that thou may fear this glorious and fearful name, <clears throat> the Lord thy God. Now, what's interesting over here is he talks about if you will not, it starts off, it's a conditional aspect, if you will not observe to do, meaning he puts observance of the law, which is knowing the law, what it is, and obedience to the law as well, which is, which is, <clears throat> which Christ basically says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So it's not, it's, it's an expression of love that comes in, which is in terms of what God is trying to teach us even through the law itself. So it is not some of the words, but it is all of the words that is written down or the words that is debarim or the Torah, the instructions. And it says <clears throat> to fear God's name, which is glorious, 
and uh, and fearful. The word glorious over there comes from the Hebrew word kabod or kabod, which is essentially to mean that it is something that is heavy. And the fearful, the word fearful over there is the Hebrew word yare. And what that means is something that is awesome. So you could read this to say that if you, that you may actually give awesomeness or make God uh, feel reverent in terms of the glory or the heaviness of his hand on our lives. And then in terms of the fearful name of God, which is an awesome name of God. And he actually goes on to say that the name of the Lord is the Lord, thy God, making it extremely personal that it is your God. Now, the point that I want to make over here is to fear his heavy name or his kabod name means to say that to bear the name of Christ as Christians, as part of our application, is to actually carry the cross, is to bear the cross of Christ. Many times what we end up doing is we make Christianity into a ritual, ritualistic religious framework where we don't actually give God the glory by doing things because we had said to do things as opposed to us actually expressing by carrying the cross, which means when it is hard for us to forgive someone, we ought to forgive someone. When it's hard for us to bless those who curse us, we ought to do that. And so things that in terms of God is saying, I want you to be distinct and separate, unlike the other nations, because what is important is you're bearing my name and that name is a heavy name to bear. And so praise be to God that by the Holy Spirit of God, we can actually give him the glory that is due unto him. And it is not by might or by power, but by the spirit is what he says. And so the spirit of God needs to give us the strength to be able to live the life that is sanctified in order for us so that we live a sin, uh, you know, a life that we're fighting against sin, bearing his cross and then following him. And in following him, people will know how awesome he is and how awesome his name is. The Lord thy God is actually Yahweh, which will kind of expand on as well, where he talks about the, uh, where he talks about what his name is. But the, is, is God your God and are you bearing his name to fear his glorious and his fearful name? The next section, Deuteronomy chapter 28, was 59 to 61. It says, then the Lord will make thy plagues wonderful and the plagues of thy seed, even great plagues and of long continents and sore sicknesses and of long continents, meaning long sicknesses that will be prolonged. Moreover, he will bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt, which thou was afraid of, and they shall cleave unto thee. Also, every sickness and every plague, which is not written in the book of this law, then will the Lord bring upon thee until thou be destroyed. Now, the word over here, it says plagues wonderful, meaning in other, other translations, it would say extraordinary plagues. These are not something that is just ordinary plagues. And the plagues of thy seed and even great plagues. So he gets to describe plagues that are extraordinary. These are great plagues and prolonged sickness. And the context over there is to be under a plague is to be under the judgment of God, as was the Egyptians. But over here, it says that he will bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt. So question, what are, what are all the diseases of Egypt? Is there anywhere in the Bible where it talks about all the diseases of Egypt? And it says what you were afraid of. Any thoughts? Bo okay, so so boils. So actually, the pastor answered the question in terms of the only of the plagues. The only plague that was a diseased plague was a boil plague. But over here, so the Bible doesn't necessarily tell us what all these diseases are. So we won't speculate. But it is something that they were afraid of, and the boil plague, which is a diseased plague, which was the sixth plague, from Exodus chapter nine, verse eight. But that only is one plague, is what it seems, right? So. How does this, how do we, how do we, we don't know exactly what all these diseases are, but we know that the Egyptians didn't suffer when the Egyptian, sorry, the Israelites didn't suffer when the Egyptians suffered, right? They were under God's judging hand. Now, question that I'll ask is, and this is often in Christianity as well, we kind of sometimes misunderstand God's character. Does God send diseases? Because we say, it's, you know, He's under God's judgment because he or she is suffering. And even though they have the faith, the prayer, it, it, you know, things didn't turn out in their favor. So I think from the book of Job, God allowed it to happen, you know. So, so the instrument was whom? So it's good to pastor, pastor talk about the book of Job. Job suffered actually with boils, right? But God would, can allow 
diseases or so as chastisement or even a, 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 a test of faith to see if you are truly in allegiance to God. But God himself doesn't. In fact, it's very interesting because the principle here is that if you do not heed to God's commands, right, then you are putting yourself, like if you don't heed to God's command, then you're violating his commands, you are living a life of sin because God's command is to live a sinless life in terms of, you know, uh, setting him apart by being set apart ourselves as sanctified people. So after salvation, there is sanctification. After sal with salvation is justification. Then with that comes sanctification, a progressive character change and the inward change to put on the inner man to become more and conforming in not to the patterns of the world, but to, to actually with the renewing of mind to be like Christ until we are like him when we see him face to face by his power when he changes and transforms us gloriously to the point of glorification but through this process of sanctification what he's saying is God is saying if you allow sin in your life then you're actually because sin and holiness cannot be commute cannot uh, be in the same place you're putting yourself outside of the protection of God's healing hand and so it's interesting over here where in Exodus chapter 15 verse 25 in fact over this is contrary what we're reading here is in contrast saying if you choose to not follow me then you're actually it's like a, a patient that knows they're sick or they're doing something to harm themselves but not going to the doctor and getting healed right to the master physician or which is which is Jehovah Rapha in fact Exodus chapter 15 verse 25 says that and it says and say and God said if thou will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and will do that which is right in his sight and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I brought upon the Egyptians, for I am Yahweh Rapha. I am Jehovah Rapha. He talks about that I am the God who heals, right? So he's a healing God and he wants us to be healed. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 15 actually reasserts that point where it says, thou shall be blessed above all people There shall be not a male or female barren among you or among your cattle. And, all, and the Lord will take away from thee all sickness and will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt which thou knowest upon thee, but will lay them upon all them that hate thee. So diseases can be instruments to teach us a thing, but God himself is a healer, not the one who brings diseases. So we have to be very careful that in his character, God wants us to have life and to have abundantly. In fact, the principle is that, and in fact, the other part of whatever, 61 says, and every sickness and every plague, which is not written in the book of this law, talking about things that are not even written down yet that shall come to pass, and the world diseases today are actually come, they come under this umbrella of the things that if by disobedience we bring upon ourselves. For example, if I live a promiscuous lifestyle, then I can expect to get you know, diseases that can hurt my body, right? So it's important for us to recognize that we are to be in the Lord and not live according to the patterns of this world. The more fundamental thing that I want us all to recognize, if you have a disease and it is a terminal disease, what happens if you do not treat that disease? What's the outcome? You die. The wages of sin is death. Sin brings diseases to the soul. And so it is important for us to recognize unless you treat it and like Yahweh Rapha or Jehovah Rapha, Yeshua Rapha is what we read in the scripture with Matthew chapter 8, verse 16 and 17. When the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, he himself took our infirmities and bear our sicknesses. Remember when, when we looked at Exodus chapter 19, verse 4, he bore them out of the, out of the land of Egypt. He redeemed them and he saved them. And now he protects them in terms of being the one who bore them out and bore our sicknesses. 1 Peter chapter 2, 24, 25, we very commonly refer to this, who in his own self, talking about Jesus Christ self, bore our sins in his own body on the tree, on the cross, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you are healed. For we, for you were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of our souls. The only treatment for a sin sick soul is Yeshua Rapha, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other means 
to which one can be saved from the sickness that plagues all of mankind. So, one thought about, so in the New Testament, there is not a single incident where person came to Jesus for healing and he would call him down. That's beautiful. Yeah. Not, not a single incident. Yeah. Pastor was saying, for those who didn't hear, uh, there's not a single incident in the New Testament where people came to Jesus and were sent apart, set apart without being healed. Uh, uh, it's it's amazing. They, uh, it, it's, it's just uh, amazing how God is uh, in that context. So Now, uh, Deuteronomy chapter in 20. The, yeah. There, is, there are, uh, the, in the place where it says he was unable to do uh, miracles that was for lack of faith. So that is true. It doesn't true. say sickness, but it does say that. Yeah. Right. He leaves like Chorazin, and I think uh, um, he says, Woe to Chorazin and to, is it Bethsaida, where he says he had to leave the place because he could not do because of the lack of faith. Good, good point. In fact, that's actually a very good point. It's the faith, the prayer of faith that heals, and the prayer of faith is in terms of salvation. And, you know, if we were to extend it to to physical ailments, if God so wills, like even we don't know about the thorn in, on, in, in Paul's flesh, what it was, was it a physical ailment? We really don't know, people speculate about it, but God may leave a thorn in our flesh to keep us always recognizing that his grace is sufficient and more than sufficient for us. But good point, Brother Srini. Qualify my statement that whoever came to Jesus by faith. By faith, that is correct, was never left. left. That's very good, yeah. Um, so, so the next part is Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 62 to 63. Let's read that. And it says, and you shall be left few in number, whereas you were as the stars of heaven for multitude, because thou would not obey the voice of the Lord thy God. Again, the same phrase there, the, the Lord thy God. And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, um, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught, and ye shall be plucked from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. Now, it's the words over there is, you know, stars of heaven, multiply. What does that remind you of? Abraham. Abraham, right? So it's the promise that was made to Abraham. In fact, interestingly, if you reverse what is said over here, it's the promise that we would read in Genesis chapter 22, verse 16 to 18. And it uh -huh. says, it's a testament, where, you know, that of God, where he says, and said, by myself have I sworn, said the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thy son, thy only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and this, thy seed shall possess the gates of its enemies. And in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. It says, you did not obey my voice. And so from what you were in terms of numerous, you know, that as the stars of heaven, you're going to become nothing to bring to naught and you won't be multiplied unlike what I had given in the promise itself. These words were given in that context that through Abraham, you know, the seed will come talking about Jesus Christ himself in Genesis chapter three, uh, sorry, in uh, Galatians chapter three, where it talks about the seed that is Christ Jesus. But what I want us to take in terms of application for us today is this. It's a word of warning that disobedience will lead to diminution, to the point of nothingness that we cannot actually be a blessing to others. So offerings, I mean, obedience brings blessings to us and it brings blessings to us so that through us, others can be blessed. And Jesus being the blesser of all, the great high priest and the one who can bless, Jesus being the blesser of all, the question for us is, for me and you is, are we living lives of obedience that showcase to others that Jesus is the one who is the blesser of all and the blessing to all nations? Otherwise, we will be taken from what we have been given to nothing is what this teaches us. So, and it also talks about how one will be plucked from off the land, meaning that the land that was cursed in Christ is blessed. But if you remove from the land, then there is no agent for the blessing to flow into the land. So we ought to live that life in the land that God has taken, that God has placed us with lives that are sanctified so that we don't actually become a means to dishonor God. And so that's the application for me and for you today, that we remember God's promise. He wants to bless us and bless us so that we can be a blessing. That's why he told Abraham, in blessing, I will bless you. 
and in multiplying, I will multiply you. So a homework for each one of us is take account of all the blessings that God has given us from health, from family, from, um, you know, just the peace that passeth all understanding, the assurance that we will be with him forever. There are so many blessings that God has given us. You can't even count them, right, as the stars of heaven. But what are we doing? Are we holders of those blessings? Is holding on to it? Or are we truly being a blessing like Jesus himself was, where he went out into the nations, he went out to bring salvation to the people. And so we bring the savior who brings salvation to the people and let us be a blessing to others and not be plucked out of the land. Yes, Pastor. So I think that is exactly what happened with the people of Israel. Right. God chose them, left with them, so they're bringing different blessings to mm -hmm. people. But then they became uh, not, how would I say, self-centered. They said, okay, we have uh, temple, law, theater, so we are special people. And that's it. You know? right. So they kept themselves aloof. Right, right. It's, it's a good point. Pastor was saying how the Israelites were asked to be the light to the Gentiles, but they themselves kept themselves aloof. And it's interesting, Pastor, you use the word about aloof because Jesus in the high priestly prayer says, Lord, I'm God, Father, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but that you are with them in this world, right? We are not of the world, but we are in the world to bring people to the world that God has given us. So it's a, it's a very good uh, reminder for us that we don't make ourselves aloof because yes, we are special people because we have Christ, but there is a whole nation, whole people group outside that don't know Christ as the Lord and savior. And we ought to be the means to be able to bring that blessing to the nations. That's our very purpose. That's the only purpose we live actually. There's no other, no other reason to live. So um, Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 64 and the Lord shall scatter thee among all people for the one end of the from the one end of the earth even unto the other and there thou shalt serve other gods which neither thou nor thy fathers have known even wood and stone God shall scatter thee among all people and you shall serve other gods God was actually bringing them into a land removed from the curse of bondage in Egypt. God was warring for them, leading them into this land. And here it says, because of their disobedience, God will just scatter them, which means they will not have God to lead them. And Sangeeta earlier talked about, in fact, prophet Ezekiel prophecies this, and he says in Ezekiel chapter 5, verse 12, he says, a third of thee shall die with pestilence and with famine, shall they be consumed in the midst of thee, and a third part shall fall by the sword round about thee, and, as, and I will scatter a third part into all the winds, and I will draw, a, draw out a sword among them. Now, what is interesting is, this is in contrast to the words of Jesus Christ when he came and looked at his people and he wept over his people. And this is what he says in Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that kills the prophet. Ezekiel was a prophet who prophesied about the scattering if they choose not to obey the Lord. Thou that kills the prophet and stone those which are sent unto you. How often would I have, this is the beautiful character of God in terms of how he likens himself to what Sangeeta was saying, the mother bird, where he says, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathers her chicken under her wings, and you would not. A picture of God where it, it, it is said, it is said that, uh, I don't know how far it's true, it said when there is a forest fire and the, the birds that gather their chicks under their wings, they would essentially cover the, the, the chicks and the fire would burn over them. And when the, when the fire is gone, the mother bird is dead in ashes, but the chicks are saved. That's the picture of how good God is. The wrath of God fell on Christ. And Christ is crying over there saying, how much I desire that you are not scattered, but you are gathered under my wings and you're choosing not to. And because you're choosing not to, you will end up being in a state where you will not even know who God is and you will serve other gods which the fathers have not known. And that's exactly what happened with, the regard, with regard to the life of Israel itself. So the application is this. They knew the one true God. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 35 says, Unto thee it was shown that you might know that the Lord, he is God, and there is none else beside him. 
And yet by your lives of disobedience, you did not make him known. And so now you will end up serving other gods whom you did not know because you willfully chose. It's like a chick that's saying the fire is on. I'm not going to go under the, the mother's wings. I'm going to just run away. And only thing that you can bring to yourself is destruction. So scatteredness and servitude is the part of the curse because you're not under the very wings of Jesus Christ, under the shadow. That's why Psalms 51 verse one, 57 verse 1, what we read, that under his wings, the shadow of his wings will be take refuge, which must be, must be take refuge, so that all calamities are overpassed. And these calamities can be passed over if we are actually under the Passover lamb's blood and under the wings of the mother God or, you know, the head. Another, 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 is the fire of the, you know, the forest, Burned the mother mm -hmm. so it did happen, right? Yeah, that's the, the, the fire of the, I mean, the wrath of God came upon Christ. Jesus. He was, I mean, he was burned in the same. Right, he was a burnt offering that was. Yeah. But whoever took the accusation, other ones were saved. The only ones who are yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so the next part, next next few verses is about panic that shall set in, and among the nations. Um, um, let me just do a time time check over here. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's good. And among these nations shall thou found, find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest, but the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart and a failing of eyes and sorrow of mind. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shall have none assurance of thy life. In the morning thou shalt say, Would God it were evening? And at the evening thou shalt say, Would God it were morning? For the fear of thine heart, wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes, with, thou, with, with which thou shalt see. What's interesting over here is it's talking about there shall be no ease for those who are disobedient and outside of the protection of God and his salvation, there shall be no ease and no peace. Um, I have a trivia question. When was the first time there is a reference that is made to the sole of one's feet? And what does that signify? If Suja is on the call, she'd probably say Genesis, somewhere in Genesis, because of the first time book. Any ideas? The soul of one's foot. So each is saying Genesis, and he is correct. <laughs> dove. dove, yeah, beautiful passage. So the dove in Genesis chapter 8, verse 9, it says, But the dove found no rest for the soul of her foot, and she returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her into, pulled her into him into the ark. This talking about Noah taking the Tao, but it says over here that the Tao found no rest because there was nothing but the judgment of God over the earth and it was a watery grave. So we see over here how if it, outside of Christ there is nothing but, but death and the soul of one's pee, feet essentially is talking that you will have no peace because there'll be no life that can be certain. We hear all that is very clear. You shall fear day and night. There'll be doubt in terms of the uncertainty of life itself. And day and night, one will be in a panic mode. The application for us today is when one does not fear the name of the Lord God, they will have every reason to be afraid with a very feeble and a trembling heart, unable to be able to taste and see that the Lord is good. So your eyes shall dim and it shall fail that you can't see and experience the Lord. And instead of a renewed mind, you will actually have a mind of sorrows. The question that I have to ask each one of us, including myself, is what are we afraid of? Or more importantly, who are you afraid of? That the Bible says in Psalm chapter 111, verse 10, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. Again, it talked about doing his commandments or obeying his, his word and his praise, faith endures forever. So what is important for us to recognize is we, we fear the Lord, because, not because that we will be punished. We fear him so that we can actually give him the, 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 his glorious or his uh, awesome name is made known to the people around us. So otherwise we put ourselves in a state where we will always be in this panic mode, hitting the panic button, because we don't have the assurance of God's protection and his peace in our lives. And it won't be a life that is of ease. Last uh, verse over there in that chapter is Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 68. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships, 
by the way whereof I spake unto thee, thou shalt see it no more again, and there you shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. Now, I want us to be careful because it says over here that you shall return to Egypt. The Lord shall bring you back to Egypt again. This is not about people losing their redemption that God had redeemed them with when God had done the Passover ordinance in Exodus chapter 12 before he led them out of the land of Egypt. But this, I believe, because of the context and the text in there about bondmen and bondwomen, is about returning to a life of bondage or slavery. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 16, actually is a verse which will make this kind of more clear that it was not that someone would lose their redemption or their salvation. Because Deuteronomy 17, 16 says, it's talking about the king that the people will want to set, whom the Lord will set over them. And it says, but he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord had said unto you, you shall henceforth return no more that way. You shall never be again because Jesus is the way and there is no more going back if you've come into the way. That's Christ is extremely clear. I mean, God is extremely clear over here. Now, what is also interesting is, and it says, and no man shall buy you. Uh, the context over here is that the people will be in such a dire strait that they would want to even sell themselves so that they could get necessities for sustenance of life. If you read the previous verses in the text, you see the previous verses in the text in terms of how there'll be so much scarcity that they will eat their own, right? And now at this point, they're now going to go, they've been taken back into captivity, comes true in the life of Israel with regard to Assyria coming over and taking over them, and then Babylon coming and taking over them, that they will return into a life of bondage, not necessarily in Egypt, but the state that they were in Egypt, but they had to cry out to the Lord and God had to remember the covenant of made to Abraham, they will be brought back into that kind of state. The point here is that you'll be in such a dire strait that you would even want to sell yourself, but no one would buy you. Now, in context to that, when we look at this in the text itself, the cause for all these consequences is in verse 58 and 62, where it says, if thou wilt not observe to do all the words of the law that are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and fearful name, the Lord thy God. And verse 62, it says, you shall be left few in number, whereas you were as the stars of heaven for multitude, because you would not obey the voice of the Lord thy God. Again, repeated over there. This means that the consequences of their state that they would be in, in dire states, was their willful choice. They chose to put themselves. It was not that God was wanting to curse them because God does not curse, he blesses, but the people put themselves in the, in the position of, of being cursed. So it's like a son or a daughter, like leaving the house, not wanting to be able to represent the father's house or the father's name or the parent's name, but instead, you know, leaving the house and no longer attributing themselves to be the people of that house and so how can the parents then help them? God being the father of all, right? He's asking for that same, you have a choice. Don't put yourself in these harm's ways. Now, I want us to go back to this question about what's in a name. What's, if you have a name, what does that mean? Like, what is, what's behind the name that you have? Like, my name is Manoranjan. So try to uh, be heartwarming or entertaining. I try to live up to my name, right? But what is what is your name? Raja Ram, right? Samson, Sangeeta, Itai, Ruben. Oh, what, what is, when you give a name to someone, what does that mean? Identity. identity. Raja Ram is saying identity. Beautiful because that's exactly what this is. If you say, if you bear the name, you are a Christian, you are a Christ one. You belong to Christ. Christianity is not just reading the Bible and doing what it says. It is following Christ who is in the Bible, reflective of everything. The, every page of the Bible is about that. So it says over here in terms of the name. In fact, the word, the, the, this verse, 20, Deuteronomy chapter 28, 58, the way, in Hebrew, the way it would read, it says, if not, you do carefully observe to observe all the words of this that are written in book, this that you may fear, name, glorious, and awesome, 
this Yahweh, your God. So what this is saying very clearly over here is to fear God's name is that Yahweh, the name of the Lord that is given, the one self-existent being, the one who is I am that I am, the master. Exodus chapter 3 verse 14 says, I am that I am, that the Lord is Yahweh, when he tells what is your name, right? I am that I am, self-existent one. And in um, and uh, in uh, in that it says, and Moses said unto God, behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and say unto them, the God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they say unto me, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shall thou say unto the children of Israel, I am as sent you. So he's saying that he's Yahweh, he is the one. The question that I'd ask you is, was God, how was God known to uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Because it says the God of the fathers have sent you. So what am I going to tell them that it's your name? And he says, my name is I am that I am. So how was God known to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in terms of the fathers as being the God of their fathers? Any ideas, any thoughts? So, so with, yeah, thank you, Pastor. So Exodus chapter 6, verse 3 actually says, God was not known to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as Yahweh, but he was known actually as God Almighty or El Shaddai. In fact, it says there, and I appeared, Exodus chapter 6, verse 3, and I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty, El Shaddai. But by my name, Jehovah, Yahweh, was I not known to them. So God is saying he's now progressively revealing himself through the life of the Israelites and through the life lineage of Abraham, saying he to Abraham, he was just, he, he was God Almighty. And Abraham believed in God Almighty, El Shaddai. As he's coming to Israelites, he's saying, yes, I'm Almighty God, and I am that I am. I'm Yahweh, the fearful name, the exist, the self-existent one. That's no creation, no, I'm not created being, I am, right? And then Jesus in the John, the book of John has many revelations of him. I'm the bread of life, I'm the gate, I'm the door of the sheep, I'm the resurrection and the life, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I am, I am, I am, I am, I am. In Christ is what it's fulfilled. Now, what's also interesting is that in John chapter 3, verse 4, uh, John chapter 13. The disciples refer to Jesus as master and Lord, right? So they talk about master and they say Lord, which is I am or Yahweh, right? And in this case, it will be Yahushua, Jesus, Jesus. And Jesus purposefully reverses that statement where he says, if I then your Lord and master, they call them master and Lord, right? So the point there is important for us to recognize that the disciples refer to Christ as master and Lord. Jesus refer, refers, reverses that and he says, if I then your master, Lord and master serve and wash the feet of the disciple, you also need to do so. So Jesus is saying, Lordship, you need to worship me. Master, you need to serve me. So worship and service go again hand in hand, we see in this context that we've been repeatedly talking about. And then Jesus goes on to say in John chapter 10, verse 30, that I and the Father are one. In other words, what he was saying is, I am Yahweh. And, the, and the, the, the Israelites didn't like it. They, in fact, wanted to stone him for that, right? They said he was... Right. Before in John, in, in the book of in John 8, I think, Pastor. So before Abraham was, I, I am. He actually doesn't say I was. I am the same part that he... And Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. So talking that Jesus is El Shaddai because and he's Yahweh. He is one with God the Father, the only begotten of God the Father. Hard for us to recognize, but we recognize the fullness of the deity of God in the bodily expression of Jesus Christ. So that God could become man so he could die and save mankind for the wages of sin is death. So what's inter interesting is, we, we, I ask a question, why is it important to know the name of God? Because without knowing the name of God, there is no salvation. Jo Joel chapter 2 verse 32 says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, right, sh shall be delivered as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. And then Acts chapter 4 verse 12 is extremely clear where it says that there is neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name other than Yehoshua or Yahweh is salvation. Yehoshua is the, you know, the variant, the, the root for Jeshua or for Jesus. And we get that in Christ under heaven or earth given by to man, wherewith, wherewith by we, we must be able to save. So Yahweh is salvation or Yeshua. So everyone who's believed in Jesus is no longer under, under bondage, but whether enough, but they are they are free and liberated and saved. 
Now, I want to read one more, a uh, couple more verses from the scripture and we'll end. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, it says, For as much then as the children are partakers of the flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and delivered them who through fear of death were all through their lifetime subject to bondage. If you look at it in the context of the Israelites, they were under the fear of death, and that led them to all the desperate measures that they had to take to sustain life itself, but were under bondage constantly. And we thank God. It says over there that you may even sell yourself, but no man shall buy you. And then we read in the book of Second, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 and 7. It's 5 to 7. It says, for there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man there shall be no man to buy you and there is the man jesus christ who bought us with his blood and it says who gave himself as a ransom for all to be testified in due time whereunto i'm ordained a minister a preacher and an apostle i speak the truth in christ and lie not a teacher of the gentiles in faith and verity in faith and truth so what is interesting over here is in christ there comes the man who can buy us out of bondage by us putting our place of faith in him. And John chapter 8, verse 31 to 36, it says, Then Jesus said to the Jews that believed in him, If you continue in my word, these are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered, now it's interesting because these people are saying, the Jews are saying, we are Abraham's seed, right? And we were never in bondage to any man. I don't know how they can even make that statement because they've been in bondage their life all the way to the coming of Christ, right? And they didn't even accept and the, believe in the one who came blessed in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord, in the name of Yeshua, Yeho, Yehovah or Yahweh. And they're like, we were never in bondage. And then Jesus says, and so how, then how can you say, they're asking him that you shall be made free. And Jesus answered and said, verily, verily, I say unto you, Whoever commits sin is a servant of sin. You are in bondage to sin. And the servant abide not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son, that is Jesus Christ himself, makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So the question is, you are either under sin or under the son, right? You can't be in both places. You've got to be, if you're under sin, you are a slave to sin and you're under bondage. If you're under the son, you're no longer a slave to sin because he took our, our bondage, and that's what we read in Romans chapter 6, verse 16 and 18. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, where, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you are that you were servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, that is from your heart you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, being then made free from sin, you have become slaves or servants of righteousness. So the question I would have for you is, you're a slave. I'm a slave. Am I a slave to sin or I'm a slave of righteousness? That's why Paul refers to himself as the bond servant of Jesus Christ. That's the title we all have to be, we all have to be aspiring to. Lord, how can I be a slave to you? Uh, like Lord and master, a master, you are my master. My eyes are on you so that I can serve you in this world that you've called us to. So with that said, I'll actually summarize and we can open it up for a time of discussion and questions. The Israelites were commanded to observe and do all the words of the law to show that they feared the name of the Lord their God. If they disobeyed, then plagues and pestilences or sicknesses would cleave onto them. Disobedience to God's voice would lead to Israelites' diminution, scattering and slavery to God's unknown to them, panic and slavery. The name of the Lord their God is Yahweh, who is the only one who can save the people from their plight resulting from it or disobedience. Yahweh and Yeshua or Yahushua, which is Yahweh is salvation, are one and only by calling the name of the Lord Jesus can one be saved. Jesus overcame death and its power by his own atoning death. And by believing in him, one is truly freed, indeed no longer slaves to sin. Question then is, are you under bondage, still a slave to sin? If you're not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, this is your time to believe so that you can be saved from sin and we can become actually a servant of righteousness. And if you have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're no longer under the old master, you're no longer under sin, but you are a slave of righteousness. Is your life reflective of that? With that, I'll, I'll keep quiet and let's actually open it up for a time of discussion, questions, comments, feedback, thoughts, and... Uh,
you know, um, a time we can learn from one another. Those on the um, chat can, I mean, if there's anything on chat, I'm not saying, but. Okay, any questions, any observations from today's study? Any takeaways? It's quite proud today. <laughs> we, we are living in Jesus Christ, but still we feel like we are not in the part of, I mean, we, you know, completely we are not at the place of uh, the righteousness. Right. And what is that? I mean, how we need to take every day? Right. It's a, it's a great question because everyone after justification still struggles to conform into the nature and character of Christ. So Radharam's question was, yes, we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but we still fall to, you know, to our temptation and we sin. Um, aspects to remember there is, uh, you may have heard this say on this side of heaven, we are <clears throat> removed from the penalty of sin, but not from the power of sin. On the other side of heaven, we're removed from the power of sin. Uh, Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, uh, it talks about how Cain, what God is telling Cain, you know, if you do well, then will you not be accepted? Sin is like a master that is lying at the door, meaning that it's actually creeping in the door into your life. Don't let it master you, right? So we struggle with it. Apostle Paul himself talks about where he says, the things I want to do, I do not do, and the things I do not want to do, I do. But praise be to God who can deliver Jesus Christ, who can deliver me from this body of death. Right. So in this body, in this marred image that we have, until we are con we're con we're translated into celestial bodies where we will have no impact of the of the of of sin itself, um, we will. Um, uh, till then, we're going to have the struggle. That's why he says that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Then you know, so so this is going to be a constant struggle, struggle till the Lord comes and we are transformed, or till we till the day we die and we go with Him and then we re re resurrected in our bodies that are glorious with Him. Having said that, uh, Romans chapter six is where it says, you know, just because I have grace. Does it mean that I can continue to keep on living in a life of sin? And he says, me gonaito, meaning God forbid that I do that, right? And so Romans 7 then talks about how we are actually part of this righteous elect. We're going to struggle, but the important thing is to always, if the sheep leaves the shepherd, is to remember that to come back to the shepherd because only in the shepherd is the protection, right? And so this, we don't lose our salvation. That's why David, when he sinned, um, he didn't lose his salvation. He recognized that the Lord is his Lord, right? So he was saved from that perspective, even though it was pre-incarnate Christ that he had believed in. Okay, the Lord said unto my Lord. And so he recognized, in fact, in Acts also, it says David by the spirit recognized him. But David sinned. He went into the, he fell into the sin of adultery and then committed murder, willful murder of, the, of Bathsheba's husband Uriah. And he, in his confession prayer in Psalm 51, he says, create in me a clean heart, O Lord, and renew a steadfast spirit within me and restore unto me the joy of salvation. He doesn't say restore unto me salvation because he didn't lose salvation, but the joy of having been saved had been robbed of him because when we sin, we're not going to experience it. Something is going to be, the spirit is going to be constantly inside, you know, gnawing at us because he is grieved. The spirit is grieved. And so it is important for us to recognize that we live the life conforming not to the pattern of the world, but with a renewed mind, which is the mind of Christ, with humility serving him and doing that until the time when we will be glorified into the eternal state where we will be like him and there'll be no more sin or the effect of sin because in Revelation it says there'll be no death, no tears, no crying, none of that. For God himself will wipe, wipe away the tears, which, which all came because of sin itself. So it's a progressive uh, struggle and a sanctification, which by our own strength we can't do. That's why we ask the Spirit and His help, Lord, you know, the Holy Spirit, let Him guide us as He leads us in the in the in the paths of righteousness, and and He will do that. That's His job. Like John chapter 16, 9 to 8, 9, 10, 11, it says, When the Spirit comes, He shall guide you, right? He shall, Jesus says, He shall teach you in all truth, and He shall actually be the one who will convict you of sin. That is our sin, our state of righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ and of judgment. So you have a choice to make to be able to, to be in the fold. Right. Any other very good questions? Sir? Any other thoughts, questions? 
or a takeaway from today's study? That was uh, being, how can you be in Christ and be as sinless as possible, right? Mm -hmm. The analogy I look at is like you're driving on, on a highway. It takes constant concentration to be in our lane. Mm -hmm. So it's easy if you sleep and you let go, it's easy to drift into the other lane. Right. So in our life, Christian walk of life, it's always we have to be focused on Christ all the time. And if we don't lose focus on him, then it's very hard to to drift. So, um, so that's actually in Hebrews it says, so Sangeeta was saying that if you are driving, an analogy you could use is when you're driving, you have to be constantly paying attention and focused on the road. If you don't, you may drift away into another place and come into harm's way or harm someone else as well. And that's the other thing, like our sin can not only harm us, it can break families and it can harm others as well. So we've got to be very careful about it. And so um, the in that context, there's a verse actually in scripture where Hebrews chapter 12, verse I think one and two, it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, or the one some verses will say, finisher of faith. He only is not only the author who gives us the faith in him, but he is the one who finishes our faith. So the exact the thing over there is yes, we can drive, but how much better if you let Jesus drive? <laughs> then there is no, no chance of accident if you let the Holy Spirit drive, right? And many times what we want to do is we let the Holy Spirit drive some portion of the way and then we're like, I want to do this and we grab the wheel and keep drive, trying to drive on our own. So, so, but our focus, keeping our eyes on Jesus, letting the Spirit drive and so we won't put ourselves, it's a progressive, you know, it's, it's a, every disciple of Christ is going to struggle. It's reality. Because he told them, watch and pray that you won't feel fall into temptation. How many times? Not once, not twice. They slept like three times in that one night, right? And so because the flesh was not willing to give, the, the flesh thought it needed rest, but the spirit was willing and, and still it wasn't allowing, the flesh was contrary. That's why the struggle that Paul writes about is this flesh and the spirit that's con constantly in conflict. But beautiful, beautiful discussions. Okay. So if I can, uh, Brother Rajaram, can I ask you to pray, if you don't mind, please, if you come. Dear Lord, actually, uh, uh, thank you for giving this opportunity to be part of Milton Meet today. And, and uh, please, please uh, uh, take care of the Sunday workshop and uh, please give us uh, I mean, your, your guidance and message and awareness, what brother was talking about in every, every part of our life. And we struggle. We know that God, but we, in your strength, we can overcome it. Please give us the strength to, I mean, keep on trying it and, and be in your path. I, I submit this whole prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you all. God be with you. See you in church. Thank you, Mano. Thank hey, you, brother, many Mano. happy returns to Sangeeta. I saw her, but I couldn't wish her. Happy birthday, Sangeeta. Thank you, thank happy you. Birthday. Happy you. birthday, Sangeeta. Thank you, thank you. Bye. Thank you all. God bless. Bye. 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 Yes.